I have wanted to make a response to Jordan Peterson on postmodernism for a while now, but I have always found it very difficult, mostly because he rarely refers to specific things postmodernist philosophers have said, or rarely distinguishes between them. Derrida, Foucault, Lyotard, Baudrillard, Deleuze, all of these philosophers typically placed in the postmodern camp have very different ideas, and if you make generalized statements about them, it is very hard to respond without knowing which specific philosopher you are talking about. Peterson sometimes mentions Derrida, but only to form some semblance of specificity, so he could then go on to talk about something completely unrelated, such as when he mentions Derrida only to then go on talking about cultural appropriation or campus censorship, as if those were things Derrida talked about. After a while of watching videos by him, I identified a few points about postmodernism that he makes repeatedly, and I will respond to them step by step in this video, hopefully dispelling some misconceptions. If you are someone who was introduced to postmodern thought through Jordan Peterson, I really encourage you to stick around and watch this video, because Peterson's misrepresentations are too influential to be ignored, and even if you have already decided that you hate postmodern philosophy as a whole, it is always better to have a good understanding of what you are against. Before getting into it, I would also like to point out the things Peterson said about postmodern philosophy that are generally correct. One, it came as a reaction to modern philosophy, and two, it points out the difficulty of finding a single overarching interpretation of the world. That's pretty much it. In brief, I think what they did was in the late 60s and early 70s, they were avowed Marxists um, way, way after anyone with any shred of ethical decency had stopped being a Marxist. By that time, even Jean-Paul Sartre had woken up enough to figure out that the Soviets hadn't ushered in the kingdom of heaven. You know, he had I will get this one out of the way first, since it's just a matter of empirical observation. Peterson makes this claim a few times. When no one could defend Marxism in academia anymore, to continue it, academics had to disguise it by inventing postmodernism. This is demonstrably false. In this video, Peterson calls Derrida and Foucault the architects of postmodern philosophy. Foucault's first major work, Madness and Civilization, was published in 1961. Derrida's first major work of Grammatology was published in 1967. Both of these works contain some of the main principles of their philosophies, such as a critique of historical method and analysis of power relations for Foucault, and deconstruction for Derrida. This was before the French riots of 1968, in which many leading protesters were self-avowed Marxists. These strikes, protests, and riots had 22% of the French population involved. In 1969, the French Communist Party received 4.8 million votes. It was the third largest party in all of France. At the same time, Italy's second largest party was the Italian Communist Party, receiving 8.5 million votes, remaining the second largest party in the next election of 1972 as well. And here, I am only going by parliamentary statistics. Many Marxist parties are non-parliamentary out of principle. What I'm saying is, the communist movement in Europe was alive during the birth of postmodern philosophy, including many prominent Marxist academics. There was absolutely no reason for academics to disavow Marxism while secretly still believing in it. And even today, Slavoj Žižek, for Christ's sake, arguably the most popular philosopher alive right now, is not only a self-proclaimed Marxist, but flirts with Soviet imagery, has written introductions to writings by Lenin and Mao, and hangs an image of Stalin at home on his wall. This theory that the rise of postmodernism was due to Marxism becoming taboo is observably untrue. In fact, a lot, if not all, Marxists you meet today will have harsh criticisms of postmodern philosophers, and vice versa. They transformed the Marxist dialogue of, of rich versus poor into oppressed versus oppressor. And the the postmodernist types is they're nested inside Marxism. So what they did instead, being highly intelligent individuals, was play a game of sleight of hand and transformed these Marxist presuppositions into postmodernism in the 1970s. The sleight of hand was, oh, well, fine, we'll just play a different oppressor versus oppressed game and we'll introduce identity politics. Peterson claims that postmodernism is Marxism in disguise because all it did was take Marxist class conflict and replace the rich and the poor with the oppressed and the oppressor in general. 
This is nonsensical because it assumes that a sufficient condition for being a Marxist is simply believing in a conflict between the rich and the poor, which anyone with a minimal understanding of Marxist theory will know is inaccurate. Are the liberals who identify a conflict between the 99% and the 1% Marxists as well? Secondly, he maintains that since postmodernists replaced rich versus poor with oppressor versus oppressed, this remained Marxism, which essentially means that according to Peterson, any ideology involving group conflict is Marxist. Does the fact that during feudal times, liberals fought the monarchy because they saw it as oppressive mean that they were Marxists? Does the fact that fascist ideology identifies elements in society that oppress healthy life mean that they are Marxists too? No, of course not. Marxism has certain necessary tenets. First of all, Marxism posits a grand historical narrative, that is, historical materialism, something postmodernist philosophers deny. Marxism typically sees history as a succession of economic stages, which many postmodern philosophers deny. Marxism sees each economic stage as more advanced than the past one, which many postmodern philosophers again deny. Marxists typically see their goal as the establishment of a worker state, which would then gradually wither away, which again, many postmodern philosophers disagree with. In fact, the postmodern philosopher Baudrillard, who, unlike Foucault and Derrida, actually frequently used the word postmodernism, did not even see class conflict as today's fundamental conflict. Marxism emerged from Hegel, that is, modern philosophy, and uses the dialectical method, which posits that history moves forward as contradiction leads to negation. For example, capitalism exists as a contradiction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. This contradiction increases in intensity to the point where the system is negated and the negation leads to a new economic stage. Philosophers like Foucault and Deleuze, instead of seeing negation as the agent of change, favored affirmation. They believe that the dialectic method simply creates a new normative standard that excludes the different, seeing it as contradictory. What they wanted is a theory that affirmed not contradiction, but difference, not negation, but affirmation. I could go on about fundamental differences between postmodern philosophers and Marxist philosophers, but here's the point. Peterson, by claiming that Marxism is disguised under postmodernism just because of its oppressor versus oppressed dynamic, necessarily loses all precision and theoretical rigor. To use Marxism in such a loose way to the point where it becomes indistinguishable from many other ideologies is to make the term meaningless. There is a reason why many postmodernists made explicit criticisms of Marxism. To look for specific things Peterson has said in response to postmodernist philosophers, this video is the most useful thing you can find. Here he makes a few statements about Derrida and Foucault, in which he at least pretends to make direct responses to their ideas although most of it is wrong. Let's go point by point. Derrida was also, and Derrida in some ways is even a more treacherous thinker because he makes the claim in some sense that like a political system has a center around which the majority congregate, let's say, it's, it's, it's quite similar to, to Foucault's analysis and that there are, there are people who are outside the category system and then, which is obviously true because no matter how you categorize people, there are certain people inside the category and certain people outside. That's actually why you categorize things. And you can't just scrap categorization because without simplification and categorization, you actually can't function in the world. Um, then, Fu you know, uh, Derrida went, and Foucault as well, went a step farther. And this is one of the incredibly crooked elements of their thinking, I think. Another sleight of hand, which was, well, category systems exclude, political systems exclude, economic systems exclude, any hierarchy of value excludes, obviously, because if there was a hierarchy of value, some things are more valuable than others, and the less valuable things are excluded, because otherwise it wouldn't be a hierarchy of value. But the, the next claim they essentially make is that the reason that those hierarchies of value are constructed isn't to produce whatever it is that's of value, but to exclude and to maintain the structure of power that's intrinsic to the hierarchy of value. And that's... This is wrong. Peterson talks about how Derrida conceives of a center that excludes people and that it exists to exclude people. Well, here is something Derrida said at a lecture. First of all, I didn't say that there was no center, that we could get along without the center. I believe that the center is a function, not a being, a reality, but a function. 
and this function is absolutely indispensable. In other words, Peterson isn't actually disagreeing with Derrida. The center, or the binaries, or the hierarchies of value that Peterson talks about, Derrida saw all of these as indispensable, as necessary for functioning. His philosophy was meant to point out precisely that they are functions, that they are not set in stone, that they can be changed. Let's go on to Foucault. Foucault did not believe that power exists solely to maintain power. In fact, he believed power was necessary for the production of knowledge. Here's a quote from Discipline and Punish. We should admit, rather, that power produces knowledge, and not simply by encouraging it because it serves power, or by applying it because it is useful, that power and knowledge directly imply one another, that there is no power relation without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge, nor any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute at the same time power relations. Okay, so then Peterson goes on talking about how postmodernists sometimes criticize scientific practice, which he takes to mean that they reject science as such, and then goes on to say that social justice warriors own iPhones even though they require quantum mechanics to be made, and this is another example of him trying to tie Derrida and Foucault into something completely unrelated. And it's a rare bloody um, social justice warrior that doesn't have a, an iPhone or a Android that wouldn't work if quantum mechanics wasn't actually correct because the fact the next substantial claim he makes is this so anyways Anyways, the worldview of the of the postmodern neo-marxists is that everybody is basically Not an individual Because um, that's really a fiction and it's a Eurocentric patriarchal fiction at that But a member of whatever their identity group happens to be and there's no real possibility of communication between identity groups hence phenomena like cultural appropriation um, and so it's a war of all groups against all groups and it's all it's nothing but a struggle for power and there's no higher order okay so there's a few things to unravel here first off he equates postmodernists with neo-marxists which going back to my earlier points makes no sense he admits that postmodernists don't believe in overarching narratives but calls them neo-marxists but neo-marxists do believe in overarching narratives so there's a contradiction there. Anyway, his claim is that according to postmodernists, the individual doesn't exist. This is not true. What is true is that they criticize the notion that the individual subject is a simple, rationally autonomous and transparent thinking being. For Foucault, in order to be a subject, you must be able to place yourself in a discursive practice that would help you contextualize the world and your place in it. And that discursive practice changes throughout history. They did not deny the existence of individual subjects as such. Similarly, Derrida said from the before quoted lecture, the subject is absolutely indispensable. I don't destroy the subject, I situate it. That is to say, I believe that at a certain level, both of experience and the philosophical and scientific discourse, one cannot get along without the notion of a subject. It is a question of knowing where it comes from and how it functions. The next claim by Peterson is that because they supposedly deny the existence of individuals, all they see is group allegiances, and so society is nothing but groups of people fighting for power. Again, this is untrue. First of all, remember what Peterson was talking about earlier. He said that in any group distinctions, some people are excluded, which is why postmodernists are against them. But now he claims that groups are all that they believe in. Well, no, Derrida is inherently critical, although not dismissive, of group allegiances not because of the simple fact that groups exclude, but because in deconstructive thought, any binary distinction will be sustained by its own negation. If you want to understand deconstructing binaries better, I generally suggest you watch my video on Sonic Adventure 2. This is not to say that he believed group identities are always bad, but that they are never set in stone and should be questioned. In fact, Derrida spoke surprisingly little about specific political policies. He was more interested in broader ethical notions, such as responsibility, forgiveness, and hospitality. And whenever he talked about politics, he did it very cautiously, with an inherent openness towards the future. There is a problem as such in characterizing Derrida's thought in such rigid terms, because rigid distinctions is precisely what Derrida wanted to expose as arbitrary. Peterson thinks that when Derrida talks about privileged terms, or the center and the margin, he is speaking of it in inherently political terms, specifically in terms of identity politics, when Derrida's claims are much more general, they are about the structure of language itself. Foucault believed that group distinctions are formed by power. For instance, 
identities of race, gender, and sexuality are not formed by those that hold those identities, but by the powers that discriminate against them. This is why he spent a lot of time researching how group identities changed throughout history. Basically, both Foucault and Derrida were critical of essentialism, the idea that everything has an essence that defines it, meaning that, for example, people are not identified by any single essence, whether that is nationality, race, or sexuality. And finally, they were not as interested in the content of different groups as in the structures that maintain them. For Foucault, whether you say that society is just a collection of groups or just a collection of individuals, you are either way participating in a certain discourse, which will to some extent be relative and ununiversalizable. It is also important to note that Foucault did not use the word power in an inherently negative way. For him, power is simply the ability to affect society or individuals, whether in good ways or bad ways. Even in a perfect society, power would still exist, but would simply be distributed symmetrically. To say that they believed all struggle is group conflict is extremely unhelpful. I'm only scratching the surface of Derrida's and Foucault's thought here, but one thing instantly becomes very apparent. The difficulty Peterson is facing is that he is trying to take philosophers with very fluid and nuanced ideas and put them in simple, rigid terms, which inevitably fails. Owing to the radically unique way that these philosophers approach different topics, the discussion is never closed because their thought inherently opens itself up to future forms of discourse. In fact, I am certain that coming back to this video in a week, I will have thought of several other remarks I could have added. And although the future always remains open and ahead of us, the video must eventually end. So let's conclude. Peterson has a misunderstanding of postmodern philosophers at a very basic level, the kind that could be fixed by reading an introductory book or two. Clearly he is not stupid. If he really wanted to, he could develop an actual understanding of Derrida and Foucault. Certainly so if I could. I do not know if he is unwilling to learn because of his biases, or if he knows he is wrong and is simply lying. But in either case, the effect is the same. Peterson's attempt to paint postmodernism as Marxism in disguise makes absolutely no sense theoretically, but in terms of his intentions, it makes perfect sense. It functions similarly to a term like cultural Marxism, because it throws together a whole bunch of different ideas into one big pile, from Marxism-Leninism, to critical theory, to post-structuralism, to intersectional feminism, and labels all of it bad in a single motion. By pretending that all of these very different movements have the same origin and the same intent, one avoids the hard work of actually engaging with the theory, and simplifies the world to the point where it can identify a single main enemy that prevents the status quo from being as good as it otherwise would be. In other words, pure ideology.